Good morning and welcome to the Lotus Training Centre. So this morning, uh, myself, Cedric, Tim and Tom have got together to have a chat ahead of World Mental Health Day and uh, yeah, see what we've got in store for you. Good morning guys. Um, so yeah, I'm Dudley. I suppose I'll bore you to death briefly with my backstory. Um, I used to play football at a pretty terrible standard. Uh, I was a rubbish central defender, I used to kick people to as slow as me. Um, and my, my day job was I was a financial advisor, so it was quite a professional job that I've been doing since I was 18. Um, just over 10 years ago, I walked out of a bar in Norwich. A uh, 17-year-old kid lost control of his car, ran with the pavement, hit me from behind, and I woke up a couple of days later in Norfolk and Norwich. Um, when I woke up, I tried to discharge myself so I could go and play football, because we were playing top of the league that day. Um, but I didn't know who my parents were, didn't know who my girlfriend was. Um, and as I sort of got a bit confused with everything, um, I found out I'd, uh, I'd fractured my skull, smashed my eye socket and broke my neck. Um, but alcohol apparently saved my life because my muscles were loose, so <laughs> I was a unlucky, unlucky guy. Um, over the next 18 months, I kind of didn't really know who I was and dived into alcohol, cigarettes um, and I was pretty rubbish at suicide, so I gave up on trying at that. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, that's a bit of a sick joke, but it's, it's what happened. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I sort of found out over the next two or three years I'd suffered a brain injury, um, which they say is like shaken baby syndrome, from when my skull hit the ground, my brain kept moving, which in football in terms, I suppose the closest thing recently to it is Ryan Mason had a, had a similar thing. Um, and yeah, as a result of that, basically I wasn't allowed to play football anymore because if I get another bang to the head, I'll be eating for a straw. Um, and uh, I lost my job because I was rubbish at maths and couldn't remember anymore. So um, that was kind of my downward spiral, if you like. Uh, everything I knew didn't exist anymore, but I looked in the mirror and I still saw the same guy. Just all the things that I was used to weren't there anymore. Um, and then a few years down the line, uh, my wife was pretty much on the verge of kicking me out and we got a young daughter and she bought me some trainers and signed me up to do a 10k run and that was pretty much the um, start of my new life. Um, turned into Forrest Gump and uh, slowly replaced all the bad vices with running, um, which is kind of where I'm at now and how I've ended up working for the Community Sport Foundation as a wellbeing run coach. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it. <laughs> you still with your wife now? Yeah, yeah, somehow. <laughs> She's pretty tolerant. <laughs> Are you still running? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So initially, when I started running, um, I started with a park run, the 5k runs they do in the city. I was told that would help me with my mental health. Um, and what it really meant was that uh, I would do a 5k run, which I'd probably stop two or three times to be sick at. Um, I'd have a cig, <laughs> get in the car drive home, crack open a tin of beer, fall asleep and basically be a waste of space for the rest of the day. Um, and that was pretty much my existence at that point. Um, and then when my wife signed me up for a 10k race up in Edinburgh, she asked me to do it for a charity called Headway, who um, do like head injuries and brain injury mm -hmm. rehabilitation. I, because I was still seeing the same guy every time I looked in the mirror, I wouldn't accept there was anything wrong. I thought back against it a lot. I told everybody else they were the problem, not me, um, as I spiralled out of control. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it was, she, by running for headway, she knew I wouldn't let any other people down. I was quite happy to let myself down. Yeah. I, had, I had no purpose waking up in the morning. But if somebody gave me a bit of direction and a bit of focus, I'd go full steam at it. And so in turn, I kind of learned a bit more about head injuries, realised the people who I was trying to run, raise money for actually for people like me rather than all those other people mm. and I was kind of <coughs> I suppose at that stage I was quite ignorant to mental health I thought oh you look all right you're all right you know and my dad's saying to me man up and I agreed with him uh, um, which actually in the long run I realized both me and he were wrong <laughs> um, but there I think it's all it's, it's, it's all the men's views of mm. mental health we just brush on the side and trying to be Machos in some capacity, you know, I was a bit similar of you for, for 16 years. I think my background is probably the same that team and, and yourself is, is mm -hmm. I was 17, yeah. um, played first team football, five, signed five year contract, 
in, in, in France, in Bordeaux, I was obviously international and played the FA Cup final, won the French League, and, you know. But I was only 17, 18, I never really had sort of an understanding of the world. Yeah. I thought everyone was my friend, but yeah. we all know that in football, you don't have friends, you don't, can't really trust anyone. The only person you need to trust is yourself and trying to find your own path. But I didn't have the right people around me. And, um, and again, I was starting at the top. And when you start at the top, it's only one way. Yeah. You, you, you go down. And it's difficult when you don't have structure in your life and foundations. Mm. You just drift yourself away. And, and again, you surround yourself with the wrong people because you believe they are the person for you in, at that moment. And my best friend was alcohol as well. Yeah. And, and my both parents was alcoholic as well. So I grew up in that, mm -hmm. knowing that was the answers of everything. But it wasn't, you know, waking up in the morning having a dream be <laughs> be before, be before training. Wow, really? Because that was my, the way I was coping with everything. Um, and a few times I used to drive to the car park there and, and I was bursting in, in tears. You know, I was coming through the doors. I was worried and petrified that everyone would find out that something was not right with me. Locking myself in the bathroom and before games, you know, the, 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 the failure of having a bad pass or having bad, bad, bad training session, that was like, for me, it was, I was really petrified of it. And, you know, at that time when I was playing, the manager was not very helpful of any kind of situation. You would dare to knock on his door and having a proper chat because you know the answers. Um, now, obviously, is, is a more yeah. acceptable, we would yeah. say. Um, but it was, it was difficult at the time. And, and I was, again, I was obviously French, moving into a different country. I didn't sort of like speak the language very well. So it was very hard to communicate with, with, with my teammates, managers and everything. So again, like you, I was like going home and, and drink. Yeah. Yeah, that was the difference. So the guy who helped me out when I went through what I was going through, I just wanted to go on from training and just sleep. So I wouldn't go to the betting office or I wouldn't drink or nothing. I just want to go home, put my head under the covers and sleep. Um, mine just crept up on me out of nowhere, really. Um, wasn't football related. I don't, there wasn't like a certain thing that started it. Um, but I could see it coming. So we had a game against Southampton away. And I said to my teammate, I won't be able to, because I was starting midfield, and I said I won't be able to play today. And I got brought off, subbed off in the 60th minute. And I seen it coming, I knew it was going to happen. And it was after that game, straight away, I took the coach into the office and said, I can't, I'm going to have to stop for a while. Um, I got two weeks off, went back to Liverpool, um, settled down there and got help off the PFA. Um, went to see a counsellor back in Liverpool, I had 12 sessions and then when I was ready Norwich said do what you want, come back whenever. Um, three weeks later I came back and was ready to go. That's great, you had all that support around yeah, as well. Yeah. How did you find talking to a person in terms of your counselling. Obviously, you didn't know that person. How did yeah. you feel like you have to open it to well, that person? The first time I went, I was sat outside the building for half an hour. Didn't want to go in. Um, but she, she was as nervous as me, really. Yeah. Like, because we're both strangers to each other. But after the first hour, you know each other straight away then. So it was very comfortable. And it really helped you in your... Yeah, it did, because it was someone who understands and it was someone who didn't know nothing about you that you could speak to, so you had nothing to worry about, or because it's co completely confidential. So, yeah. I, so I, I went like you. I went to see a counselling, but I stopped after the second one. Mm -hmm. I felt uncomfortable to speak about my private life to a person I actually didn't know. Yeah. And I, at that point, I needed someone around me who know me, know me, the real me. Mm -hmm. um, because we all know that when we are not very in a good place, we, we, we put a mask. Yeah. We're trying to put a mask in front of everyone because you're obviously scared that they will find out. Um, but it, me, for me, it takes me 16 years to open up. And, and through them 16 years, one of my family members stole a quarter of a million pounds of my investment. All my future, gone. My dream as a footballer, gone. Everything. And, and suddenly, everything sort of like get destroyed around you. Mm. Um, my, my marriage broke down and I refused to speak to my wife at the time. 15 years, she didn't know what I was going through. 
So I was like lying and, but again, he's, it was nothing to do with, with her or even my kids. It was, it was, I didn't feel happy in myself. I didn't love myself the way I was and I couldn't sort of open up. And I think it's the hardest things to, to actually admit something is not right in yourself and, and talk to a person that you can trust. Because I think it, at that moment it's very important to trust that person. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've done the mistake of talking to one of my best friends, which didn't really help. Mm -hmm. He was a bit like you, like your, your dad said, man up, be a dad, yeah. be a father, be an husband. Yeah. But when you're in that place, you can't function. No. Mm -hmm. You can't function and it's difficult. It's weird as well because sometimes it can be hard to talk to people as well, um, like as far as y your immediate family. Yeah. Because for me, a lot of it, I kind of I hid behind a smile, which I still do. Yeah. Um, and but your smile is your protection. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. it's my mask. Um, and behind that as well, you kind of nervous about talking to your immediate friends or your family um, about how you're feeling because you don't want to burden them with how crap you're feeling, for want of a better word. Um, and so I could relate to what you were saying, Tom, about how when you, when you saw a counsellor or a therapist or whatever, um, it's kind of a lot easier to burden a stranger mm. with, with your problems, which is actually where I found the run-ins work for me as well. Because when you run with people, your inhibitions sort of seem to go and then we stop for coffee after, and these are people you don't know that well, and you're just mm. you're able to talk about it. I suppose in some ways it's kind of like a, an unbranded, like Alcoholics Anonymous, but, yeah. but not alcohol, um, yeah. just on how you manage and deal with different problems. And everyone's obviously got different circumstances that are brought to them, and how they've reached out for help. And that's yeah. the thing that I really like about what both you guys said, about how you almost sort out to help yourselves, mm. um, be, it, be it immediately or, or further down the line. Uh, for me, it was arrogantly thinking I wasn't the problem for a long time until I banged my head against the wall so many times I realised maybe I need to open the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's, for me, uh, when, when I bring a bit down to my situation, I had like twice, um, I was in a bit of a bad place, twice. <laughs> so before, when I was like 15, six, yeah, around 15, 14, you know, I come from a very healthy background, family background, where like money isn't really an issue, yeah. and I had no, you know, no plan in my life what to do. So um, I I ended up in alcohol. I started to drink when I was 13, I think, because I I thought like, yeah, what do I do with the yeah. money, you know? <laughs> and my friends, they were all a bit older than me, so they were drinking. They were smoking, uh, all sorts of things. So I started to smoke all sorts of things, which um, was a bad idea back then. But yeah, I did it. And At that age, did you have sort of like um, a, a goal in your life? What you wanted no. to achieve, what you wanted to do, or be a footballer? See, my, I always wanted to become a footballer, but I was in the youth team of um, FC Basel, which is the biggest like club, was the biggest club in Switzerland, or is still the biggest club. but. Um, yeah, I was in the under 16 and then uh, at the end of the year, I just, I struggled in school. I, um, I got kicked out of three schools and, uh, you know, I was drunk most of the times during breaks in school. I went to smoke. Um, yeah, and I was just always in that, you know, a world of dreams always. And, you know, I was not really there. So um at the end of the year i went to the coach with a cigarette in my mouth and said like, i don't want to do it anymore so i thought like you know be strong show everyone that nothing can you know bring you down or anything so i just took took all my stuff put it in the back and said like, i'm not going to do it anymore so i dropped the back um lightened up the cigarette and then just left the place and i was like oh that's like you know now i'm free and everything but soon afterwards i felt like well, I'm, I'm going to fall back in that hole. So mm. I started to drink again, started to smoke even more. And uh, I had that one night where I almost like had a heart attack, where I just started, you know, ending up at the park bench somewhere mm -hmm. yeah. close to a lake. I don't know, don't know where it was. I was like complete, I was alone, you know, and I woke up in the morning all by myself and, you know, a bit wasted still. And, and then I was like, okay, now, you know, I need to wake up actually. Yeah. Then I found um, I found my wife actually quite young. I found then afterwards it's 16, 17. Um, she helped me a lot. I think we both like you know tried to work it out together. But I was still that person who never wanted to talk about my problems. Mm. So I was always like you know show everyone that you're strong. 
yeah. even though you're not. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I get, uh, I don't know how, how it ended up me being you know back in the professional football world and I was lucky or whatever, but I, I, I you know I turned that switch and and. and became a bit more professional and, and tried to get away from everything so um, and then with 22 23 I did I made the move to Germany mm. and um, I thought like you know as you said everyone everyone should like me yeah. so I, I started to do the social media stuff and all that things and and when there was a bad comment I texted that person right away yeah. I said like why do you why do you think I'm a bad player yeah. I, I just I just don't you know I don't don't get it so um, I ended up again um, I played like six months every game for the first team and then all of a sudden I fell back into that hole and then that was when I shot down completely and um, even my wife now she was like I didn't talk to her at all my family I just I thought like if I tell them that I'm weak mm, yeah. that makes me look so bad and they would judge you yeah, yeah. So I thought, I thought like, you know what, go to training, go back, play FIFA, but back then it was FIFA, you know. So I, was en I ended up playing FIFA from, I don't know, the training is maybe until one o'clock, two. So from two until four or five in the morning, I just, I was in front of that PlayStation. Went to bed, slept two hours and then came back training and it was just not the right thing yeah. to do actually. Mm. And then all of a sudden I started to you know, reach out for some help. And then I I have a mental coach and I still have that guy. Yeah. It's the, still, uh, the same guy that I had when I went, was in Germany. So, and um, we talk every week mm -hmm. and it's, it's good to talk to a neutral person yeah, who is completely neutral, who won't judge you, who won't like, you know, give you that, oh, everything is going to be okay. Yeah. You know, your yeah. mom, you know how your mom is or your dad, they want to, my dad is the same. You know, get up. He's German, so it's like you know, get up and do everything in the proper way. And they would and solve my, problems for yeah. you. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. And they think like you know, my my dad comes from a generation like after war generation. Yeah. You know, they got raised like you know, you have to do this and there. There is no emotions and stuff like, not like completely like that, but it was quite strict. And my mom was the opposite, so she was like very emotional, you know, caring and stuff like that. And then. Um, yeah, I, I needed that person, just a neutral person. Yeah. And, and yeah, that, yeah, that, that, would give, that would give you probably a balance in your life. Because yeah. you, said, you said your dad was obviously old-fashioned, basically, <coughs> and your mum was being emotional, but you needed that person in the middle to yeah. give you that right balance. Yeah. And my wife wasn't the person either. So, you see, like, I, I would, now I can talk to her mm. about everything. Mm. It's like... I feel happy to talk about my problems now, but it's like a weight off the yeah. shoulders. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I still have, you know, some. You know, when that when the thing happened with my knee, that kicked me back into like so many bad uh, you know, memories, yeah. and and then I started to think, you know, I'm 31 now, and then you see how many young players come up. You think like, oh, is it, you know, is it is it over? You know, now we're 31, which is a joke, actually, you know, you still have like four or five years to come normally. But uh, then you start to doubt yourself, as I thought. You start I, your, yourself as a human being, also your ability as a footballer. Yeah. As and I failed me. That's, that's the thing, you know. And then I started, I couldn't smoke any or drink. I do not do that anymore. So I started to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just... French food. Yeah. <laughs> uh, French fries for me. And the Oreos, man. Oreos were my best friends. <laughs> it's a vicious circle you can get into, though, isn't it, with all those things. And I think also the more and more people I speak to about these sorts of things as well, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, what your background is. Nobody's Teflon coated. No. Um, I thought, I genuinely thought, when I because I, I, I received a compensation settlement as I'd lost my career, mm. Um, in financial advice, following my brain injury. And I don't know why, but I stupidly had at the back of the head the whole long, once I've got this wedge of money, I'll be okay, yeah. which means I won't have any problems anymore. And it's nonsense. Um, if anything, that was the scariest moment because it was actually once I got money yeah. and I realised my problems didn't disappear, yeah. it was like people just assume once you've got the, the funds in place, you know, yeah. that's, that's the end of it. Um, and it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't actually protect you from anything. Um, if anything, you feel more vulnerable because you start to question why people are around you and why they're 
doing the things they do allegedly to help you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone has the right idea, yeah. and the best idea to you know to take your money and yeah. invest it. But that's you know as he, as he said. Me me yeah. me happened from 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 I, I would probably said it's from my mum. Yeah. My mum, you know, the person make me, you know, in this world just yeah. took everything, and and it was very hard to digest that because if you can't trust your mum, who you go, who you going to trust? Mm -hmm. And, and I just sort of like, I was a bit like a total. I went back into myself, detached myself from everything, everyone, uh, the football world, the, 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 you know, the, the, the world who, the football world give me an education and, and, and everything I am today, you know. I couldn't trust anyone, mm -hmm. so I couldn't drift away from everything. I tried to take my life three times, you know, 2012, 2016 and recently 2019. Early 2019, so you know, is is it was tough, but I went I went to a, an, 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 a psychiatric hospital in, in Norwich. I was there for two months, and you know, obviously, a strong medication, and you got good professional around you and give you the tools. Mm. They give you actually give you the tools when things no, are not right in yeah. your life. You obviously know the trigger, on, and and you can sort of um, talk, and that's what happened to me. I, I started to talk a bit more and just purely is on my last day at the hospital, the, the doctor was going to sign my letter to release me. She said, obviously you're an ex-footballer, you, you know, you know, which is a such a small city, everyone know you and why have you never thought about doing an article mm -hmm. that will help you, but will help many other people. Mm -hmm. And it took me quite a while to understand the question, how I'm going to, to do it, how I'm going to obviously my proud and you know to come out and 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 and, and put that black and white on the on a piece of newspaper, but I did it. And to be fair, since that I've never looked back. It's helped me massive. A, bit, a lot, a lot of people around me as well. And even now, when you walk in the city or wherever, people say, oh, mm. "Thank you, you have helped me." And I don't even know that person. Yeah. So it is important to us, you know, especially footballers, who have the courage and the strength to come out of it because you don't realize how the impact you can have mm. outside Kone training, outside Carroll Road. And again, the city is such small and Norfolk is a very hard, you know, people, ha people have worked really hard yeah. uh, through their life and they appreciate when you come out and say, look, mm. I've not been all right. Yeah. And, 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 the, and they, 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 they love it. You know, and, and, and I think it makes you more real to them, doesn't it? Because you're not this perfect. You know, you know the footballer. Yeah. They don't look you as exactly. a footballer. They yeah. look you as a person, the human being behind all of, of what you achieved in your life. Um, and, and and again, is is always said, and that is, I've learned that two or three years ago is never judge who the person is on your left, who the yeah. person is on your right, or in front or behind, because they don't know what they go through in their life. Yeah. Always have a kind words for them person just with the tune of your voice yeah. is important. You know, w w we are men. When you see your mate, you have not seen your mate for years mm. or weeks or months, and you say, are you all right, mate? Yeah. He would say, yeah, I'm all right. And the conversation stopped there. Yeah. But the girls, they don't exactly the same. They don't see each other for years or months or weeks. Are you all right, darling? Yeah, I'm fine. Do you fancy a coffee? <laughs> and straight away, they go for two hours having a chat. And us, we can't do it. And, and and, and, and if we start to change all of that, it'd be, you know, we will help each other a lot more. There's two things you said there, actually, that are so true um, to, to my own situation. One being the coffee, because um, I, I never used to drink coffee. It was just alcohol all the time. Um, and since I've sort of stopped, not, not stopped drinking completely, but since I've you know, yeah. got it under control and do my running and whatnot, I would love to go for a coffee with my mates and just sit and have a chat, pretty much like what we're doing now, just an open, honest chat. But every time I try and organise something like that, they want to go to a pub. Yeah. Um, and but so that is in English culture. I've I've not been drinking for three years since since I left the, the hospital. I make a promise of myself that I don't want to be like my mum and my dad. My dad was violent. He was drinking. He was abusing me mentally and physically. I was petrified to know when it was going to be a time that my dad is going to come home. I was petrified. I was hiding. Finding your mum in the in the kitchen floor in the morning, it was it was difficult. But that that gave me the strength to have a goal and a dream in on, yeah. in my life and and make me achieving what I wanted to achieve. Because we only got one dream in her life, 
my dream was to be a footballer. I have privilege and honor to have been able to achieve that. Not as long as I wanted, because people think, oh, you, you stopped playing because you got a bad knee. Or No, 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 me was all up there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't cope to go in the morning and face my teammates. I couldn't. I couldn't do it anymore. I think one of the other things as well, that like, like with the warning signs there, um, I think we've all sort of touched on it in, in bits and pieces we've gone along as well, about be, being self-aware of when you need help, but also for the, for the time that you're not aware of it as well. Um, and other people don't necessarily, you know, it's not to put it on other people as a responsibility, but to be aware of the signs that someone maybe isn't quite is the, themselves. Is the, is the trigger. You've got yeah. a trigger and you know. And when you know, that is where you need to be aware of it and, and the right people around Cause you. Because I think my family saw, not my family necessarily, but maybe more my wife mm. saw, the, saw the signs that there was issues there. Um, but I wasn't willing to help myself. I had, to, I had to accept there's something wrong first, and I didn't, I was fighting have back you, against have it. Have you spoke to your wife since your Yeah, yeah, I mean, she's, she, she saved she my life, there's no two ways about it. Um, she got me to run in and... <laughs> I, I think it's, you're right, you know, to, to find, you know, to, to find exactly that moment to say, like, you know, now I'm in a bad place mm. and I need help, but to find that moment is mm. so hard yeah. when you're in there. You must have to Because it's like of, this yeah. devil, yeah. devil circle yeah. that brings you back always yeah. to that point where you go like, nah, nah, it's everything, no, no, I, you know, everything is okay. And then you end up doing it again and then again and yeah. then almost to the point where now it's, you know, it's too late and then I think then it's the, there is one but trigger. It's a circle and everything starts with the thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go to the emotions yeah. and the misbehave, mm -hmm. and then the outcome, yeah. and you go like that. It can be positive, but it can also be negative. Mm. No, but it's it was for me. It was like you know, I ended up playing until late at night, and then I was like, went to bed. Like, hey, come on, I need to stop doing that. You know, be professional again. Woke up in the morning, and then it was like I was so tired. I was like, oh no, I have to go. To, and then I was back in the circle. You yeah. know, I was like, mm. I'm tired. I don't want to do it again. Yeah. You know, from the thoughts, from the positive thoughts I had in the evening yeah. to the morning, yeah. it was like, you know, a completely change of, of scenery. Yeah, yeah. And then I ended up being like, in, you know, I came, went to training and even my teammates, I was like afraid of their judgment yeah. towards me. Mm -hmm. Well, you walk in the match on the audience oh, and if, when you go through them doors, you, you, you almost like you walk your head down yeah. because you don't want to make eye contact with anyone. It's crazy. Anyone. And I was like, you know, every time I made a mistake on the pitch, I was like, oh, what do they think about me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of them. Mm -hmm. And I thought more about what they think about me than, yeah. than what actually... And your concentration yeah. just go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's completely gone. And you lose it and your confidence is gone mm -hmm. and everything is gone. You will have some good days, yeah. you know, where you think... But, but, but when you are in that sort of frame of mind, you always put negative thoughts in your mind, mm -hmm. but you don't actually think about the positive you do. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is your mind is straight into a negative? Like you, you were saying, like, the comment of a media when they write something wrong about you, yeah. there's other medias who've been writing good things yeah. about you. you don't but you don't, you don't, don't, you don't, you don't see that. You always pick the negative words mm -hmm. who sort of like trick your mind. Yeah. You get to a stage where you, where you won't accept any compliments no. or anything. Any compliment anyone gives you, you pick faults and even just the way they worded it to you, yeah. like that was really good. Oh, it was just good, was it? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Going back like to that. what Tim said, when I went through what I was going through, I was I was in my own apartment. So, like usually, if I had cash, if I was living with someone, I could like speak to them about anything, like football, family, anything, just to take my mind off it. But when you're on your own constantly, you're literally yeah. always you thinking. You drill about yeah, something. Yeah, all of the, everything's on your mind because you've got no one to talk to, so yeah. you're, you're thinking all the time. And that was hard going back to no one. Yeah. And literally either sleeping or thinking about yeah. not wanting to go in the next day and. So when, when you come in the training in the morning, do you actually, it was a release for you? No, I didn't want to go. You like, didn't want to come training? Ever since the age of six, I've always wanted to go training. But yeah. that period, I was like... You wanted to just detach to yourself away. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the confidence was a killer. Yeah, we, yeah, the, we know that the confidence yeah. in football is the big factor. It's, yeah. it's, it's important. It's massive, yeah. And, and again, it's the, the, the a perspective of how you conduct yourself, but also the people around you, how they view yourself in training. If for six months you've been absolutely at top in training and then suddenly you know to your best, you worry about yourself. Yeah. It's the image and you give to the people around you. Yeah, like at the time the football wasn't even a problem for me. Uh, I was playing well and stuff, but then when I wanted, when I didn't want to come into training, that's when it started to affect me. When you like, go through them doors? Yeah, 
it was like I don't even want to be here and then that Very started rubbish. playing on and I couldn't even focus on the pitch like now I can, because you wanted to be pitch, away yeah you want when I'm on the pitch it's just football mm. but then it was just like what am I going to do after training like I'm just going to go home again and just which is what I suppose football was for me before I got injured and then and then now now it's like running really um, I, I play rubbish all my time I was in knowledge <laughs> <laughs> but again people judge you but again is they judge you on the football field but they don't know you as a person when yeah. you go actually go through yeah I remember that uh, um, I had it's funny that my dad was twice then there and I had a chat with him when I was 16 or 17 and that was the best chat in, you know, for me to just make that yeah. switch. Mm. And it was my dad, you know, who was so strict and all of a sudden he was like, you know, emotional and that. And then the second one was like, I was never, I was, I swear to God, like I always try to avoid to, you know, show emotions in public, mm. always. Yeah. And um, when I had this bad period, I was playing so bad actually on the pitch and we had a game against like um you know we had like let's say we played the Aston Villa game now on a Saturday you know the pressure is high you, you you almost have to win the game and everything and then I made a mistake in the 90th minute and we lost the game 2-1 and I remember me walking off the pitch and then I was like okay hold it together everything is okay as soon as you're alone you can you know yeah. burst mm. out in tears or whatever you yeah. want so I held it together and then all of a sudden I saw my father standing on the on the stand in front of you know just waiting for me and I looked at him and I was like and the, and the media guys they were like yeah you have to do interview you have to do interview and I was like I can't do interviews right now and then, you know, but you have to. And it's like, okay, I do it, but I want to see my dad first. Mm -hmm. And then as I walked all, um, towards my dad, I was like, you know, I kept it so much together and mm -hmm. I felt so strong. And then my dad said nothing. Yeah. He said, come here. Okay. And like gave me a hug. Mm -hmm. And then I, was, I started to cry so much. I was like, why, why is this happening to me? I have done nothing wrong. You know, I treat everyone, you know, as, as they are my friends. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I think, always positive you know now even more than back then and then i had to do the interview afterwards and i was just in tears and uh, oh, uh luckily it's not in the internet anymore but, <laughs> <laughs> but wait, see, when you make a mistake on the pitch you always think why 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 me yeah, yeah when something yeah. goes wrong in your life you say why me yeah. why and you get bitter about everything around you mm. you know it's how i felt i was bitter about everything i'm like why me why everything happened to me yeah. but Everything has happened to me, make me who I am today. Yeah, yeah. And that's the positive things for, for me in my mm. life. You make me who I am today. Of course, you know, I'm, you know, I don't have my kids every day, but I'm privileged to see my kids. Yeah. You know, and me and my ex-wife, we're best friend. You know, and that, that is important to give everything I do on a, during, a, during a day or every day or you know, the mental way of talk and everything I've achieved the last three years. That is a foundation for my kids yeah. to make them understand that they will face challenges in their life and obstacles, mm -hmm. but it's no point to run away from that. Mm -hmm. They need to face it and find a way to find the other way, the other side of it. You know, it's always a positive and a negative, always. But you need to find yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's, yeah, like, in fact, kids, kids for me, my kids are, are my driving force now and my wife. Um, you know, before before the accident, I was pretty self-centered. Mm. It was all about me. Yeah. Um, it was about earning money, working, partying hard, working hard, play hard, etc., etc. And it's now almost, it's almost you take your your your, your family for granted. for granted. Yeah, yeah, completely. Completely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and now it's, it's. I mean, I see a therapist once a week still, um, and we sit and we have a chat for an hour. And uh, I do as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every week. <laughs> we should save each other money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's 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 been quite a journey, and it's weird actually because for a long time, I I had the why me, why me, why me thing, um, and then it changed, and it became I almost felt guilty for surviving or for not being worse injured because I'd see people with worse injuries yeah. and I was thinking, why do I feel so bad yeah. when they're worse? Because yeah. all these people have said, oh, it could be worse, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You should be grateful. You've got, you've got this, you've got that. Yeah. And it's you, all relative at the end of the day. You, you, you still don't think, feel crap. But you don't think about no. things like that when you're in the bad place. But certainly I think um, 
I think that even just in the 10 years since I've had my issues, I think services have definitely improved um, as far as what's been available for me. But I also, in a way, I feel lucky because the kid who ran me over was insured mm -hmm. and so I had access to private services and I didn't have to sort of wait for support yeah. from the NHS. I mean, I know you mentioned the PFA earlier were a good support for you yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. With, with the sort of support you've had at different times, um, is there anything else you think that maybe still needs improving or developing out there? Well, for me, is, is when I contacted the PFA about my issues, you know, it was about three or four years ago, they just sent me a leaflet and a number to call. That's mm -hmm. it. But we know that when you know in a good place, it's difficult to pick up the phone and, 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 and talk to that person on the other side of the mm -hmm. phone because you don't really know that person. Mm -hmm. Footballers, you feel a bit more comfortable to talk to someone who's been part of that world. Yeah. It's yeah. hard. I would say it's so hard to, for yourself to reach out, yeah. you know, to get to that point to say, actually, now I need help, mm -hmm. you know, because you will come here and you will act so normal. Mm -hmm. So Robert Enke was a good uh, example. Mm -hmm. He played with a good friend of mine, and he was the. They were like best mates at the time. That was the goalkeeper for Novo yeah. who killed himself afterwards because he had mental issues. And um, he said as well, he came to training every day and he looked so normal. Yeah. And you, you did not see that he was mm -hmm. mentally ill, mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden he killed himself, you know. And you go like, oh, what, what, what yeah. happened, you know? Yeah. There. So, I think. If there is someone, no, I think Norwich is, is quite good in trying to put someone, you know, we have the um, John Norman, mm -hmm. I think you, yeah, you know, John, yeah. um, and I know he's, he's, uh, it's like a religion's yeah. view, you know, mm -hmm. behind of it, yeah. but then in the same time, he's someone you can talk to, yeah. and he's like, you know, he's normal, and he's not like the guy who comes in with that, like, yeah. white thing, and you go know, <laughs> like, mm. You know, I'm not like, it's you know. more than modern pasta. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that's a, a good try. Norwich tries to mm. help you there to give you that one, you know, like hand to to reach out if you yeah. need anything. It's important yeah. to be able to reach out to someone. And even met, I mean, I've only met John a few times, but one of the key things, and I think it's almost like one of the biggest skills I think he's got is that he just listens. Yeah. He doesn't come at you with solutions during your conversation. No, it's like fantastic. That. Even yeah. I, like, since I'm here, like, you know, I'm very good at it now. I have so much positive thoughts now. I'm much better. As I said, I still talk to my guy once a week, yeah. as you two do. Yeah. Uh, and that helps me a lot. But John, in the, in the same, was, was, was there as well when a friend, well, when someone of my family died. You know, yeah. that kicks you sometimes back mm. if someone closed eyes. Um, and then I said it in an interview as well when we were like doing some charity stuff and then people came up to me and said, oh yeah, it's good that you talked about it. because you know, they start to see you as a normal person. Yeah, yeah, all yeah, of a person. Mm. yeah it's good. I think it's, it's important, you know, that, that guy, that, you know, that guy. That and keep talking. And yeah. and keep it's, it. it's also very important that someone reach out to you. It's important not to judge, but also to listen. I think yeah. listening is important. You don't have to say anything sometimes. Yeah. You just let that person talk. When I, when I rang the PFA, when I decided it was time, they literally put me on hold, seeing if, how quickly they could get someone to chat to me. Wow. And it was the next day, they rang and said, yeah, yeah there's a counselling session. That's fantastic. In Liverpool, yeah. So it was quite good for me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's brilliant to hear, <coughs> and that, that support's available. I think, um, I think we'll probably sit here and chat about this all day quite <laughs> easily. <laughs> but um, I think at that stage, we, need, we probably need to wrap things up for this morning. So uh, thank you, Cedric, Tim and Tom, for, yeah. for joining me this morning um, and talking about mental health. Cheers, guys. Thank you.